This audiobook contains scenes, language, and subject matters unsuitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. The dense foliage rustled as a multicolored bird took flight. The forest was alive in every direction, and every step I took seemed to reveal a new sight or wonder, from plant and insect to the pocket-sized furry creatures that dwelled in and around the thick, towering trees. I followed closely behind Casey, captivated yet cautious. These people, this tribe, I tried to keep my voice steady and neutral. They're not going to start throwing rocks and spears at me, are they? Based on my last observations, you should not face any hostility from the colonists. You mean the colonists' great-great-grandkids? Or did I add one too many greats? There are now six generations, she replied. God, I exclaimed at the thought. Six generations within a hundred years, they really wasted no time. I glanced at Casey as we crossed a small stream, her hovering metal orb perfectly balanced on two small thrusters. While I'm in stasis, how often do you visit them? I do not visit, I observe. Well, how often do you observe them? At all times, my mobile units are spread across the island. That doesn't freak them out? Seeing, well, you? I am only permitted to reveal myself when you are present. Permitted? By who? By you, sir. I exhaled, half rolling my eyes. Right, of course. I guess I forgot. The joke went over the AI. The journey was relatively short. In less than an hour, we were on the white sand beach, approaching the largest of the five villages. As I crossed into the outskirts and saw the first of them, it felt like I was walking into an old nature documentary. My arrival wasn't a surprise. Casey later told me they had been waiting for me since sunrise. Yet, they were still taken aback and awestruck by the sight of me. I slowly raised my hands, attempting a casual, friendly smile. Hi there, how you all doing? Their collective action interrupted me. Kneeling in unison, they began to chant. I turned to Casey, trying to decipher the word. Are they saying, cradle? In your previous attempts to communicate, certain words were taken into their vocabulary. I stopped. They can talk? Only a select few words at present. The reverent chants continued. As we pushed into the main square of the village, I saw young and old mothers gently force their small children to kneel. The older children, meanwhile, were unable to take their eyes off of Casey and the rolling service bot. I turned and paused. On large, flat-faced rocks I saw murals, simple black and white etchings of a figure bestowing gifts with a floating white ball beside him. Another mural had the same figure standing atop of the cradle itself, his arms outstretched as if blessing those below. I was a deity to them. I was Krada. The last image on the line of murals caused me to stop once more, for it was both unsettling and poignant. Krada crowning a smaller veiled figure, clearly female, outside a white tent, a tent that was now directly ahead of me with the villagers knelt in rows on either side, providing a clear path. They knew why I was really there, they knew who I had come to see. Casey held back as I slowly approached the white tent. The closer I came, the more I noticed that only the female villagers were on either side of me, all in their early twenties. The strips of white bedsheet that hung over the opening fluttered in the breeze, as though an invisible hand were inviting me in. Slowly and nervously, I peeked inside. Hello, is it all right if I come in? A silent figure sat alone, perched on a large white cushion. She wore a traditional white wedding dress, slightly faded from time, her face concealed behind the net of a veil. Nestled on top of her low head was a distinct gold tiara. I glanced back at the villagers, who had now fallen quiet, the strips from the bedsheet masking their view. I took in the spacious interior of the tent. There didn't seem to be any personal belongings of any kind, not even a table. Most likely, the villagers brought her everything she needed. White drapes with simple black images adorned all of the walls. Butterflies. 
I felt a cold chill run through me. I pulled myself together and tried to sound as warm and approachable as possible. I knew your mother. I mean, your great-great-mother a long time ago. She gave no response. Her face was impossible to read behind the veil. Am I... am I allowed to see you? Her head shifted ever so slightly. Do you understand what I'm saying? She didn't. I indicated the veil and made a lifting gesture. Can I see you, please? She paused a long moment, hesitant, then slowly reached up and gently drew back her veil. I froze at the sight, my heart skipping a beat. Her eyes were green, her lips and nose slightly thinner, but the resemblance was uncanny. You look so much like her. Images flashed through my mind, white bedsheets, a hand on my cheek, Elena's smile as the tip of my finger traced her tattoo. Elena's fifth descendant felt my lingering stare and lowered her gaze. As she did, I glimpsed her hair. It wasn't black, but a dark shade of brown. The small difference seemed to shake away the memories and allow me to regain my focus. It's all right, I assured her. You don't have to be afraid. I'm a friend. I just came to see how you're doing, how all of you are doing. I noticed her fingers fidgeting in her clasped hands before she stopped herself. An ache of sympathy took hold of me. Are you happy? I had to ask. Are you happy here? She gave no response. I looked away and tried to think, wanting to do something for her. Anything. Would you... I hesitated. Would you like to see where I live? I offered out my hand. Her eyes shifted to my open palm. There was another glimmer of understanding, not of my words, but my request. I stepped out of the tent. Elena Five slowly followed, her veil concealing her face once more. Across the square, the villagers stood in quiet, orderly lines. Casey was systematically scanning one of the men. I raced over with restrained fury. What the hell are you doing? I said we're not doing that anymore. Casey stopped and rotated to face me. I am assessing the general health of the current populace. I glanced aside and saw the small children also waiting with their mothers. All right, I conceded, that's fine. Casey rotated again, registering Elena Five standing nervously and obediently outside the white tent. I'm taking her back to the cradle with me, I declared. Is that why, sir? She's coming with me, I repeated firmly. She needs new clothes, a shower, proper food. Very well, sir. Casey resumed her medical scans as the service bot rolled toward me. I shall guide you back. Her voice came from the bot. Chapter 4 We moved through the forest, with the service bot taking the lead. Elena Five walked with solemnity, her movements reminiscent of a nun in quiet contemplation. After a few moments, I broke the silence. You can take that off. It's okay. She cast a confused glance in my direction, clearly not comprehending. Making a lifting motion, I tried to clarify. The veil. It's not necessary, even back in the village. Understanding seemed to dawn on her, and she slowly pulled the veil away from her face. The sudden exposure to the daylight made her squint, her green eyes taking in the vastness of the sky above. Guess you haven't been out in a while, I mused aloud. As we continued, the forest gave way to the grassy clearing, revealing the cradle. Elena Five stopped in her tracks, her eyes widening in awe or fear. I couldn't quite tell. She dropped to her knees, bowing her head low in reverence to the glistening structure. Hey, it's all right. I reached out to help her to her feet. There's no need for that. Ahead, the service bot drew closer to the entrance. The gates, sensing our approach, began to slowly part releasing a brilliant cascade of light that bathed the clearing. Elena Five looked towards it, her entire body trembling. Don't be afraid, I reassured her. There's nothing to be scared of. Her gaze turned to me, confusion evident. I held out my hand, a gesture she understood. The glow of artificial light streamed through the expansive high window screens of the lobby. I watched her step forward, her every movement hesitant. It's based on the larder and Whitworth, I started to explain. I remembered it last night. Her attention was captivated by the ornate chandeliers hanging from the high ceiling, their luminescence mesmerizing her. We used to stay there when we... 
I stop myself mid-sentence, correcting, sorry, not we, I meant me and her. Seeking a distraction, I called out, Casey, are you here? Yes, sir. Casey responded over the general intercom, able to be everywhere and anywhere at once. She needs clothes and a room. Casey led us to what was obviously one of the more modest guest rooms on the lower levels. I frowned as I inspected the stark interior. I'm guessing this was for the volunteers. Casey's voice confirmed, yes, sir. Sighing, I asked, where are the clothes? A full-length mirror illuminated, the room's only other prominent feature aside from basic amenities. Casey explained, a selection will need to be made. I smiled at Elena 5, gently guiding her towards the mirror. Here, just stand right in front. She did as instructed, but the moment the mirror scanned her, she jumped, startled. It's all right, I reassured her. It's just checking your size. The screen displayed various clothing options, though without words, just images. Among them was a rather flamboyant white princess gown, complete with a golden tiara. Shaking my head, I mused aloud, I think something a bit different is in order. Dismissing the more outrageous choices, I focused on more elegant evening dresses. See anything you like? She looked overwhelmed, completely lost in the sea of digital clothing options. Hoping to help, I tapped one particular design. The screen displayed her reflection in a stunning green dinner dress. Her hair and makeup were also magically transformed. I couldn't help but marvel at the sight. You look amazing. She touched her own reflection, astonished by the rapid transformation. But when I spotted a particular dress in a color I knew too well, I reached out excitedly. This one. It's your favorite color. Looking towards the ceiling, I added, Casey, can you help her dress? Casey responded promptly, Yes, sir. Specialized units are available to assist. Elena 5 stood still like a statue as the mirror continued to digitally morph her appearance, cycling through makeup variations and hairstyle designs. Alone in my executive suite's bathroom, the automated shaver hovered around my face, its lasers meticulously removing every single spot of stubble. Another pair of robotic arms trimmed and tidied my hair with precise movements. That's good. That's enough, I waved, a hint of impatience or nervousness in my gesture. The robotic appendages obeyed, retracting back into their compartments, giving me room to inspect myself in the mirror. But as I took in my appearance, the reality of the situation gnawed at me. What was I doing? Why did I bring her here? If I wanted to give her good food and new clothes, I could have had Casey send everything through one of the service bots. A rush of conflicting emotions washed over me. I backed away from the mirror and shook my head. No, I wasn't doing anything wrong. I wasn't making her do anything she didn't want to do. And until the day I die, I never would. Inside the lounge hall, the ambiance created by the candlelit table and its bottle of red wine was sure to impress. I sat in my black tuxedo, every passing moment making me more restless. Casey, what's taking so long? I blurted out. A moment later, Casey floated in with Elena 5 behind her. She was draped in a blue figure complimenting evening dress, but something was amiss. One shoulder strap hung loose, and she was without shoes. I am afraid we had some wardrobe difficulty, Casey apologized. I quickly dismissed it. It's fine. My attention was preoccupied with Elena 5, who was now rubbing and licking her lipstick. Hey, that's not meant to be tasted, I gestured. Her puzzled look told me she didn't understand. The makeup, it's for looking good, not tasting good. As she continued to feel my gaze, she became noticeably uncomfortable. Casey? I said, eager to change the topic. You can go. Bring in the appetizers in 20 minutes. Casey's hovering orb left us alone. Stepping closer to Elena 5, I smiled. Let me help with that, referring to the strap of her dress. After a nervous flinch, I managed to return it to her shoulder. There, much better. I smiled again, but her focus had shifted to the candlelit table. Like it? Got us the best table in the house. The quip went unnoticed as her attention moved to the piano. That's a piano. To play music. I snapped my fingers, remembering, Music! That's what we're missing. I tapped my wrist comm, a playlist already prepared. 
I was going to have this play before you got here, completely forgot. The smooth sounds of jazz filled the large, empty lounge. Elena Five's eyes darted in surprise, trying to locate the source of the unfamiliar sounds. Speakers, I explained, gently turning her by the shoulders. It's coming from speakers up there. I stopped and looked down at my hands, my thumb unconsciously stroking her skin. She noticed and I immediately withdrew, changing the subject. This song, I think it was one of her favorites. I remember us dancing in places like this. She loved to dance. The familiar music had me unconsciously moved to the rhythm, the strange light swaying no doubt confusing Elena Five even more. Just hearing this, I smiled to myself, it's bringing back memories. I again found myself holding her, this time by the hips, continuing to sway. Here, I guided her to an open space. We have to stand a little closer. I attempted the slow dance, but it was clear she didn't know how, our movements lacking any harmony, becoming more like a clumsy shuffle than a graceful waltz. I continued to gently sway her, guiding her, but she stumbled and almost fell. It's okay, I got you, I reassured. You just have to move with the music. I gently lifted her hand, intending to twirl her around. As I did, a sudden rush of memories flooded my senses. A vivid image of Elena, her laughter echoing in my ears as she effortlessly spun under my arm, our moments of past dancing melding into the present. I came to and noticed Elena Five's arm awkwardly locked behind her head. I immediately let go, my face flushed with a mix of embarrassment and dissolving nostalgia. Sorry, I forced a smile. I got carried away. Elena Five didn't understand what I had said. The ruby red wine swirled in the glass, casting a deep hue against the candlelit backdrop. I watched her as she took another large bite of the chicken leg, juices dripping down onto her blue dress. Glad you like it, I commented with a smile. She spat out a small bone and dove back into the tender white meat, ignoring the rest of the spread that had been prepared by the service bots. I poured wine into a glass and offered it to her. Here, it's red, her favorite. You might like it too. She eyed the wine with curiosity, slowly taking the glass. Just take very small, I began. But before I could finish, she had downed the entire glass. I sighed. Sips. She let out a noticeably unladylike burp, quickly wiped her mouth, and returned to her chicken. The refinement of the setting didn't matter to her. Food was food. As we later moved through the lobby, her unbalanced steps faltered. The wine affected her more than I'd anticipated. It's all right, I've got you. But as I led her into the elevator, her knees buckled and she crumpled to the floor, fast asleep. I gently laid her down on the large bed in one of the empty suites. She rolled away on the white sheets, causing the strap of her dress to slip from her shoulder again. For a moment, I hesitated. A familiar memory flashed, my fingers softly tracing the edge of the butterfly tattoo on Elena's shoulder. Elena turned and smiled up at me with her inviting hazel eyes, drawing me close for a good night or morning kiss. I lifted the fallen strap back onto her shoulder careful not to disturb her sleep. My eyes lingered on her face. Despite the smeared lipstick, chicken grease, and red wine stains, her likeness under the dim lighting of the silent room was uncanny. But she wasn't her. That much was clear, and she didn't belong here. She let out a soft grunt in her sleep as though confirming. Her nose was tickled by a stray lock of her wild hair. I gently brushed the errant strands behind her ear and let her rest. From the comfort of my suite, I watched from afar as the villagers bowed and cleared an opening for Elena Five, back in her white dress, veil, and tiara. Two elder women parted the strips from the opening before she disappeared into the white tent. Within seconds, the villagers resumed their everyday work and activities. I wondered if any would ask her why Krada had taken her to his home or inquire about what she had seen inside. According to Casey, this was unlikely. 
My past self's recordings made no mention of bringing any of her descendants into the cradle. I asked Casey and her answer confirmed it. This was the first time I had done so. Chapter 5 The soft clink of my scotch glass broke the stillness of the lounge hall. I set it down atop the piano and began to randomly tap on the ivory keys. To my surprise, the random tapping transformed into a flowing melody. Before I knew it, my fingers were gracefully dancing over the keys, evoking the timeless notes of a Chopin waltz. Pulling back, I looked at my hands in astonishment. Casey, I can play. You have been playing since you were nine years old, Casey informed. Turning on the stool and leaning back against the piano, I sighed with frustration. I thought all my memories would be back by now. The duration of memory loss will vary from subject to subject, Casey replied. I sighed again, thinking about my previous exploitation of the stasis chamber. Going in and out of stasis every 20 years? Is that a factor? It would likely play an influence, Casey confirmed. My gaze drifted across the empty hall, settling on a particular table. The table I had shared with Elena five last night now looked identical to every other table. Over these last few decades, have you noticed further developments in the villages? I attempted to sound only casually curious. Their vocal capacity has been steadily increasing over the last 80 years. I paused, again feigning casual interest. All of them or just a few. Development will vary from subject to subject, she responded. But eventually they'll all be able to talk, right? Talk like I'm talking to you now? It is inevitable. I fell quiet, sensing where my thoughts were pulling me. A more recent memory lingering. The longer you take no action, the more Elena's descendants will appear less and less like her. Eventually, that face we loved will be permanently lost to time. The wall screen initiated the facial analysis, the imaging software cross-referencing every minute detail of Elena's face with those of Elena 5 and every male in the database. The entire process was completed in seconds. Facial analysis complete, Casey announced as the faces of several male villagers appeared, some barely in their teens, one perhaps in his forties. Candidates isolated. I immediately averted my eyes, feeling the cold fingers of guilt around my throat. I don't want to see them, just show me the final results. The male villagers were replaced by six potential Elena Sixes. One drifted too far, with a head shape that was too narrow, but three resembled Elena more closely than even Elena Five. How accurate is this? I inquired, restrained excitement replacing my previous guilt. There will always be variables. There is currently an 82% chance of accuracy. I studied the options and gestured dismissively. Remove one, four, and five. The three shortlisted candidates expanded to fill the screen, all projected at age 20, with their full-figure high-resolution renderings slowly rotating. I again averted my eyes, this time for a different reason. Just focus on their faces. The visuals adjusted accordingly, concentrating on their faces and removing the display of their exposed bodies. I moved closer to the screen, studying each face intently. The third one elicited a flicker of a memory, Elena laughing beside me in the back of a sky limo, her smile radiant. Can you adjust their expressions? I asked, now fully engaged. Make them smile? The three faces broke into simultaneous smiles. My gaze shifted between two and three before settling firmly on option three, the specific curve of her lips and the shape of her white teeth, which, according to Casey, could be predicted with a certain degree of accuracy. That's the one, I declared. That's her smile. Candidate three was magnified, filling the screen as her head slowly rotated. The next potential Elena, six. I slowly backed away and sat down on the foot of the bed taking a moment to gather my thoughts and suppress my conscience. All right, remind me what happens next. Crap. 
The morning sun shined bright over the village. From the solitude of my suite, I watched as the men and women formed a circle, their voices unified in repeating chant. The chanting grew louder and more fervent. In the center of the circle, bent on one knee, was a boy of 17, quiet and committed. The cold fingers of guilt returned to grip my throat. A male elder held a silver crown high, its shimmer catching the sunlight. With reverence, the crown was placed on the boy's head. Upon rising, the boy offered a bow in the direction of the distant cradle, and then another towards the white tent. The beat of drums joined the ever louder and more impassioned chanting. The entrance to the white tent was opened by two young women, inviting the boy to fulfill what Krata had asked of him. With a blank, empty face, the boy moved almost rhythmically to the beat of the drum, drawing nearer and nearer to the tent. The cold fingers around my throat tightened their grip, moving to my chest as the pounding beats intensified. Casey had told me that the act itself would be short and that there would be no physical contact beyond what was necessary, but that didn't change how I felt in that moment. As soon as the boy entered the tent, I asked Casey to cut the feed. I spent the rest of the day in the bar and did not fully recover until two days later. By then, Casey confirmed that the second attempt had been successful. Lying in the open pod, my heart raced. The cool, sterile silence of my surroundings did little to alleviate my anxiety. Stasis, Stasis duration, duration, set to 20, 20 years, years, Casey confirmed. I hesitated, still reeling from the effects of days of drinking. What if something happens to her while I'm gone? There is no guarantee of a flawless birth. For either of them, Casey responded, her tone logical and devoid of emotion. But if something goes wrong, can you wake me? I cannot interrupt your stasis duration, she replied. If she's in danger or needs help, can you bring her here to medical? All access to the cradle requires a priority passenger to be present. My heart pounded, visions of potential tragedies and complications playing in my mind. I just need to know she'll be safe. Amelina is the highest priority for all of the villagers. She is tended to at all times and is never without an escort. She's a prisoner, I said, my voice faltering between a statement and a question. It depends on your definition of prisoner. She can't leave or live freely. She has lived her entire life as an Amelina. It is considered a great honor. Amelina, you keep saying that. What does it mean? It has become her known title. She who embraces Procrat in honor of Krata. She who passes her sacred birthright to the next generation. The previous Amelina. What happens when there's a new one? The previous Amelina is free to do as she pleases, but seems to remain highly regarded in the community, Casey clarified. Hope emerged from the pit of my anxiety. So she's happy? Happy with the life she has? I cannot determine that. Closing my eyes, I grappled with the looming decision. Elena Five was with child, a fact that was undeniable. I could stay awake for the next nine months, guaranteeing her safety with the advanced medical care of the cradle, or take the leap into 20 years of stasis and meet Elena Six as early as tomorrow. Time was not a factor, only my patience and the validity of my concern. Cradle, written by Mahul Desai, based on an original feature film screenplay by Mahul Desai. This novella has been AI-assisted. All scenes, characters, situations, and dialogue have been taken from the original feature film screenplay. WGA West Registry, 247147. Music licensed from Pond 5. Special sound effects by Serban Matai. For more information, email intothecradle at gmail.com.